Good morning and welcome to the HS Foundation's webinar about biologics and HS. My name is Brent Hazlett. I'm the CEO of the HS Foundation based in the United States. This webinar is being broadcast in five languages and is being recorded for later viewing. If you are having any difficulties at all with selecting your interpretation, please use the Q&A box to alert us. Uh, just so you know, the chat function is not enabled, so please make sure you use the Q&A function. Uh, please take a moment to answer the quick uh, pre-webinar questions that should be popping up on your screen right now. It should just take a minute to do that. Uh, while you're doing that, I will introduce the moderator for today's session. Uh, thank you all for taking time out of your Saturday to learn more about biologics and the HS, and then certainly want to spe uh, give a special thanks to our two presenters and our moderator today. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's session, Ms. Jasmine Espy. When Jasmine was diagnosed with HS, as I'm sure many on this uh, webinar will be able to attest, uh, loneliness, shame, and isolation began to settle in. Amid this uncertainty, she knew one thing to be true. She didn't want anyone else to feel the way she did. The more she learned about healing her body, the more tools she gathered to help others do the same. For Jasmine, advocacy means more than being able to speak up for yourself. It means owning your story. It means lobbying to ensure people without access to proper care have a voice and are extended equity. From blazing trails and multimedia journalism for marginalized communities, to emerging as a documentary filmmaker and storyteller, to recently becoming the founder and CEO of the Association of Hydradenitis Separativa and Inflammatory Diseases, Jasmine is a living testimony that owning your story is your power. Please welcome Jasmine Espy. Hi all, I am so delighted to have you here today um, for this webinar titled Biologic Treatments for Hydronitis Supertiva. Um, I will be moderating the Q&A box, so please feel free to enter any questions that you may have um, throughout the presentation. And um, as a quick note, just some housekeeping things before I dive into introducing our amazing speakers for today. Um, please remember to refrain from asking questions that are related to your personal health um, situation um, because we cannot offer medical advice. However, we can provide guidance around biologics and those specific treatments. Um, so with that being said, um, I am joined here today by two amazing speakers, Dr. Syed and Dr. Dave Louie. Dr. Syed is a professor of uh, dermatology um, at UNC Dermatology, where he is the director of the HS clinic. He offers patients a variety of management options, including medical, surgical, and laser treatment for their condition. He is involved in the NIH fund, uh, funded scientific research in several clinical trials related to HS. And he is also on the board of the HS Foundation and medical director of Hope for HS of the NC. Uh, triangle, uh, triangle chapter. Um, Dr. Dave Louie, on the other hand, is an associate professor and program director at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. He holds special interests in teledermatology, non-invasive skin imaging, skin of, uh, for skin of color, integrative dermatology, and complex medical dermatology, including hydronitis superativa. He is the immediate past president of Wayne County Medical Society and serves on the editorial board of the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology, while also building a growing body of publications of his own. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks very much, Jasmine. I was just checking, has Chris been able to get on yet into the webinar? <clears throat> He's supposed to be on in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted to <clears throat> welcome everybody to this morning. Thanks for taking the time out to join us. We're hoping to kind of give an overview of these treatments that you may have heard of that we call biologics. Um, and Chris will get into a little bit why they're called biologics and we don't just call them a medication even though they are a medication because um, there are some things that make them unique. Um, we will be talking about these with HS because there are two biologics that have been FDA approved to treat HS. Um, so we'll kind of get into it a little bit, give you some of that background information about what they are, how they work, what the potential risks and benefits could be. And hopefully we're, we hope it will help you to make decisions with your provider 
uh, about the best treatment for you. As Jasmine mentioned, please in the um, questions, avoid asking specific questions because we aren't able to give any official medical advice. I'd love to be your doctor, but I can't be your doctor at a webinar. So I can't give you any official medical advice through here, but we can answer more broad questions. So we can't tell you what to do, but if you have questions about biologics or treatments, we can kind of broadly answer those questions um, and hopefully that will be helpful. And I see we've got Chris now. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Syed because he's going to start off the presentation and then I'm going to bring up the second half and then we're going to make sure to leave lots of time for Q&A. Yes, excellent. Thanks so much, Steve. Sorry again, I've, I've got everybody uh, off kilter here, most of myself, um, but I am getting my screen share to bring up the latest version of the PowerPoint here. All right, I think I got it. All right, I believe hopefully everybody can see now. Yep, let's perfect. Do All right. it. Excellent. All right, so jumping in. So, yeah, you know, this is a uh, you know topic, of course, biologic treatments for HS, and I'm sure there are lots of questions. Biologics has been around for a long time, and there is a lot of chatter online, which is understandable because I think it can be. A, uh, confusing and feel different and more intense than most other medications. Um, but hopefully we can give some good background information. Um, I know I'm getting us off to a little bit of a later start here as I got things set up. So I'm going to jump in. So, you know, biologics have actually been around for a very long time. A biologic kind of refers to anything that is sort of a non-chemically manufactured drug, which typically comes from a biologic system of some kind. So even things like uh, when people donate things like antibodies uh, and those are pulled out, you know, that was sort of the first types of biologic used really, those were non-chemical drugs that were derived from other humans, um, or sometimes from things like other animals, like an anti-venom that's derived from something like a, a snake uh, that's used to treat snake bites. Um, and as time uh, passed and, and sort of uh, biologists really understood how a lot of these sort of human systems worked, uh, they were able to take advantage of that to create things you know, from different cell lines. So things like you know, yeast that create, uh, you know, uh, or sort of, uh, you know, bacterial cells that can be used to create medications that are, you know, truly biologic in nature, produced in nature, um, and then manipulated in some way often to sort of make them more specific and safer. And so when we think about hydradinitis in particular, you know, that's the the one drug that is FDA approved right now is one called adalimumab. It was approved in 2015, so about eight years ago. Uh, but it was not really a new drug at that point. It was something that was used for many other conditions. Uh, and as with most medications, people start to think about what can you repurpose drugs for and use them to treat other things. And so since uh, this its target called TNF was very important across inflammatory conditions, it started to get looked at for things like rheumatoid arthritis first. So its first actual approval was in 2001, and that was for psoriasis and dermatology. And another similar medication called infliximab that we often use in, in hydradenitis also um, was approved in 1998. So over 25 years in which drugs like this had been on the market um, for inflammatory conditions. Uh, and those trials went back as far as 1992. So it was you know, a huge amount of science into understanding how to create medications like this, um, how to make them safe, how to make them uh, you know, in large enough quantities to actually treat people. Um, but they were developed um, you know, with very specific you know, ideas in mind about how they could be used. And now they're treat, used to treat tons and tons of different things. Um, and that goes you know, beyond just things like inflammatory conditions. We think about the most in dermatology for that. But even when you think about things like the antibodies, the monoclonal antibodies used to treat COVID that were kind of talked about so much as an early treatment, you know, that was derived in a very similar way as a way to treat, um, instead of targeting something that's inflammatory to target something like a virus. Um, and so they really have very broad and sort of uh, very customizable uses. And so when we think about biologics, there's different types, but monoclonal antibodies tend to be the most common one used. Um, and again, these are, are typically produced by some kind of living cell. So, you know, when we make our own antibodies to fight things like viruses and other infections, you know, our body recognizes that something is a threat and it creates these antibodies as part of that response that are very specific to just attack that one thing that's in our system that we're trying to get rid of. And so what people realize that, you know, a lot of our antibodies, um, hopefully you can see my mouse cursor here, but the lower part of the white part of the antibody is kind of you know, sort of found across pretty much every antibody. And the target site, the one that sort of recognizes one very specific uh, target to go after is kind of at this yellow portion here. And 
So the, your antibodies are sort of customized by your own self once it recognizes a threat to target something very specific. So, you know, the a one specific antibody might target this yellow antigen here, but it wouldn't target any of these other ones. And so what we realize is that we can sort of manufacture essentially very specific recognition sites to go after, uh, you know, whatever target we want. So for example, TNF or IL-17 or other things that trigger inflammation throughout the body. So now we can customize to pretty much any target we want. And early on, you know, before people got really good at doing this, they sort of had to use different systems like mice and, and um, other partial proteins. So the early uh, medications like infliximab have a little bit of mouse protein in them, but almost all of them now are completely human. So they are, you know, all human protein that's just customized in some way to be very targeted. You know, one of the other big differences, you know, we think about little tiny molecules like aspirin, and there's a lot of interactions when we think about chemical drugs because these small molecules interact with each other in all kinds of different ways. So we're constantly concerned that, uh, you know, the body is going to metabolize them differently or one medication is going to interact with another. Um, you know, as you start thinking about things like hormone replacements, you know, these are uh, sort of a medium size, what's called a large molecule drug. But when you think about antibodies, they're much larger. And typically something like this just can't pass throughout the whole body, but because it mimics our human antibodies, it can go throughout our body just like a human antibody can, like our natural ones can. So it sort of has that programming to be able to get everywhere that it needs to get, um, even though it's a much larger molecule overall. Um, you know, because they are also made from proteins, just like, uh, you know, uh, things that we ingest all the time, they can't survive coming through the stomach. So that's why we typically, when we talk about biologic drugs, can't absorb them very well through the gut. They're all broken down kind of as soon as they get into the system. So it'd be great to have, you know, biologic drugs that could be taken as a pill if people prefer that. But that's one of the big sort of uh, sort of downfalls of biologics is that they just can't be absorbed that way. Uh, but again, the nice thing is, as opposed to other chemical drugs, they can't interact with uh, with other typical chemical drugs most of the time. So from an interaction standpoint, when people are on complicated uh, sort of long list of medications, we don't have to worry about those interactions happening that sort of conflict between the different medicines. And then the question of, you know, who are these medications for? Of course, it depends a whole lot on what's being treated. Um, and it's going to depend on the risk of the medications, and it's going to depend on how much benefit they get. Um, and in general, when we think about hydradenitis and sort of what most of these drugs are approved for, most uh, drugs so far have targeted you know, moderate to severe, to severe hydradenitis, which does not really have a perfect definition when it comes down to it. Um, most studies have, have sort of uh, filtered out by patients who have at least five inflammatory lesions um, and have at least some scarring and tunneling present. And I would say that, you know, whereas that's where sort of the, some of the FDA approvals and things like that are explained, or that's how some people define moderate to severe disease, there's a lot of wiggle room there because, you know, with hydradenitis, uh, you know, I'm sure, you know, all the patients in the audience know you can go through a day where, Maybe you just have one or two spots that are flaring up and say, well, you know, why don't I qualify if, you know, two weeks out of the month, I would have five lesions, right? So I think, you know, when we evaluate patients at a single time point, you know, it, it's very hard to take all that into consideration. So I think if you're somebody that has, you know, disease that's been very difficult to manage, maybe you don't have this, you know, number five, like, you know, exactly five lesions or more. Um, but I think if it is affecting quality of life enough, um, it is, uh, it is really important to go and kind of start treating based on how much harm it's causing and how much benefit the drug's going to potentially get. Um, and really, I think, you know, in the HS community in general, we've recognized this need for earlier treatment, right? Like why wait for tunneling and scarring to develop when we could potentially intervene earlier and do a much better job at preventing that from happening and preventing things like the need for surgery, right? So um, I think there are a lot of considerations here. There's you know, sort of that nitty gritty of, of how the drugs were approved, but then there's the real life considerations of how much is somebody struggling and do the benefits clearly that way to drawbacks. Um, and th there's very specific considerations too. Again, we are being very targeted with what we go after here. So there's not, you know, a whole lot of sort of, you know, extra effects beyond what we're trying to target most of the time, but there are other considerations, right? Things like TNF have other roles in the body besides just inflammation. Um, and we've recognized that patients that have very severe heart failure probably should not take TNF inhibitors because it can sometimes make sort of unstable heart failure worse. Um, or things like IL-17 inhibitors, when they were studied in things like inflammatory bowel disease, uh, they cause more flares for certain patients. And so we're selective kind of knowing those potential side effects, avoiding it for particular patients. Um, but for the most part, I'd say like, you know, 95% of patients or more don't tend to have strict reasons why they couldn't use one of these particular drugs. And then the other thing that always comes up is if you take a drug like this, you know, are, how long are you going to have to wait for it to work? 
Um, and I see a lot of patients who have been stuck on a medication like this for, you know, a year, kind of waiting to see improvement. Um, and it's been very frustrating because, uh, you know, at some point it's time to move on and make sure you're seeing benefit. And so typically with medications like this, it's going to depend on which one it is. It's going to depend on, um, you know, uh, you know, things like dosing sometimes, but usually you can see responses sometimes as soon as two weeks with HS where the pain at least is getting better and you have a sense that something is improving. Um, but it may take, you know, three to six months to really see the maximum benefit from it most of the time. And in some studies, even after a year, there's this sort of slow improvement as the inflammation is calm, things have had longer to heal. Um, and so, you know, but, but I would say if, you know, two or three months goes by, you're really not seeing any response at all. I would generally be hesitant to say it's worth kind of keeping on holding on for a year, right? Like typically when you look at response curves for medications, this doesn't have to do with um, HS in particular, a medication would use to treat HS, but usually the improvement happens over this sort of eight to 16 week time period. And then it kind of plateaus after that. So if you're you know, not seeing anything by the time you get to 12 or 16 weeks, I don't expect it to jump up all of a sudden uh, and see a huge response. So again, that sort of three month time point is where my patience is kind of worn out typically. All right, and that is it for my starting point here. I'm gonna go ahead and unshare my screen. I'm gonna pass it back over to Dr. Dave Wui. Thank you, Chris. And now uh, hopefully you guys can see my screen. Perfect. So we live in a great age where there's so much information at our fingertips with the internet and being able to share things. Um, but I think we all are kind of aware that it can be good and bad. There's a lot of information out there, but how do you sort through it and kind of understand what applies to you and what's uh, proven information? Um, so we've done some studies to sort of look at this, what's out there. Um, and we've done these studies for HS, kind of what's being put out on the internet for HS. And so um, one study looked at Facebook posts because there's a lot of activity on Facebook with people sharing their experience. Um, and they found that 40% of Facebook posts were asking about treatment information. So people are out there trying to find out about treatments. You know, did it work for you? What were the side effects? What was the safety? Why did you consider doing it? And then another study looked at Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. And they looked at were the posts from physicians or from patients. And a majority of the posts are from patients. Doctors in general aren't super great at social media, although the younger generation is getting more into it and getting better at it. But, you know, a lot of doctors, they only use Facebook just to, like, connect with their classmates. And then another study looked at YouTube, um, and they found that patient videos tended to get more likes and were more popular, but didn't have as high quality of information. <clears throat> and they used this little tool to sort of assess the information that was shared. And they also found that the patient videos were more likely to recommend treatments that didn't have proof that they worked when they compared those to the ones put out by uh, healthcare providers. So it's just to say that you have to be a little bit careful. It's great that we can go online and see things, but you always have to think about who is sharing this. Is this an accurate source of information? And it doesn't mean you need to ignore anything that's not put out there by a doctor, but just always remember it and sort of have a critical eye when you're looking at the information. So patients love sharing their experience, and there's a lot of good things about that. The best is that it creates this online community. So if you live somewhere and don't know anybody else with HS, you can connect with other people who have HS. So you, you've nor normalized that experience. You don't feel like you're the only person who's going through this and no one can understand you. Um, it also, sharing your experience online can help other people because you might share something that really resonates with them and really helps them. You know, you might share something about how you handle your emergency kit in case a boil bursts on you. And they might do the same thing and have a lot of help from that. And then of course, it's easier to go online and see information than it is to necessarily contact your doctor or get into a doctor. You can instantly go online, but you can't usually instantly get into a doctor. Downsides are the information shared from your experience or from someone else's experience may not apply to others. Um, and sometimes that creates a false hope where someone may go on and say, I changed my diet and it cured my HS. And then people think, oh, if I just do that, it'll help me. And then when it doesn't help them, it's really discouraging. So it gives them that false hope that it's going to help. Some people 
don't understand if their side effects are from their medication or not. You know, sometimes just something new happens to you and it happens to be after you started a medication, but you may mistakenly share that as a side effect. You know, I fell down and broke my ankle and it was after I started a new medication. So I think that medication made me break my ankle. Um, so sometimes you might see side effects posted that aren't really from the medication, but just happen to happen to the person. And then, like I said, you don't really know the source. I think we all know there are trolls on the internet and some people who go out there just to ruin people's day and share misinformation. Um, so you always have to be a little bit careful that and think that, hey, this might be someone who's unfortunately intentionally sharing bad information. And then if you haven't heard of this idea of an echo chamber, that's the idea of if I go to the internet looking to get an answer to a question, like if I say, you know, uh, I want to know all the dangerous side effects of this medication. That's what the internet's going to give back to you. And so it, so it just kind of tells you what you want to hear if you're not careful in the way that you look for things. And you might end up just hearing all the same things that you already were kind of afraid of, and it sort of echoes for you. <clears throat> They've also done studies looking at what are the barriers for patients when it comes to treating their HS with one of the biologic medications? Because if we can understand those barriers, it'll help us to have better ways to get people medications they need. So almost two thirds of patients were nervous about side effects. Totally understandable. I think that applies to all medications for all diseases is you wanna consider the side effects. Almost half were worried about the cost and insurance coverage. I think that also is a, a major concern that unfortunately we're sort of used to with our healthcare system is worrying, is this gonna be covered? Or am I gonna have to pay out of pocket for part of it? And then almost a third were also um, worried about the frequency of the injections. So not many people are excited to give themselves an injection, although they have some nice delivery systems that make it as easy as possible. Um, but people worry about that. You know, How frequently do I have to give myself these shots? And then I wanted to just take a minute to sort of give you a definition of side effects, um, because we talk about side effects for medications a lot, but we don't always talk about what that means. So when we do a study for a medication where we're getting it approved by the FDA, the FDA has a rule that if something happens in more than 1% of the patients who are in the study, and it happens more in the people who are getting the active medication compared to the people who are getting the placebo or not getting the medication, that's considered a side effect. So more than 1% of people had it and more patients in the group had it than in the placebo. It only has to be one more person in the group than in the placebo for it to be counted as a side effect. So that's why sometimes if you really look at the study data, it seems like the number of, of side effects for the placebo, certain side effects for the placebo and the drug are similar, but if it was a little higher for the drug, it gets counted as a side effect. An interesting idea when it comes to side effects is that your risk may actually depend on the disease you have. So certain diseases increase your risk of having other health problems. And so sometimes those side may show up as sort of a side effect of the medication or a suspected side effect, but your, your risk is a little bit different based on the disease that you have. And then there's something called a boxed warning or the old name was a black box warning. So the boxed warning is just the FDA's most serious warning. So it's something that they think is important to talk about. You know, they kind of have this list of side effects because they include anything, but these are the ones that it's like, all right, make sure you talk about these with patients and with your doctor. Um, so it's just to bring attention to a serious side effect. And it's just to highlight that one and make sure that you have that discussion. I always make sure when I'm talking about side effects, when it comes to HS, we also talk about the side effects that come with not treating your HS. Because as Chris mentioned, HS is this disease that progresses and causes damage to the skin and the tissue. And so it, it, there are side effects if you do let it go and it's, it's sort of getting worse. So that's an important thing to consider and to talk about with your healthcare provider too, is that you know there are side effects of doing nothing for it. And then we always wanna weigh the risks and the benefits. So some of the benefits of medications can be they control diseases, prevent it from getting worse. Um, so that's why I was talking about that possible that it could be progressing, um, improve your symptoms, which is the most important things to patients, get that pain under control, get that itch under control, improve your fatigue, 
And then I think it's important to talk about which side effects are reversible. So whenever I'm talking to my patients about side effects, I make sure to point out which ones go away when people stop the medications. Because for me, that's really important to know. If I get a side effect and I know that when people had this side effect and they stopped the medicine, they went back to normal, that makes me feel a little bit safer that this isn't a, a permanent side effect. And then when we're speaking specifically about HS, um, treatment can help to prevent surgery. So we know that once those tunnels form and scarring, that some a lot of patients require surgery. So if we can treat and get it under control earlier, that may prevent that. And then it might prevent some of the complications too. Um, that is a little bit harder to study, but we're trying to work on it to see if reducing that inflammation overall in your body can help prevent some of those other complications that can come with HS. On the risk side, it's really important to talk about those side effects. And whenever possible, it's nice to get them told to you as a percentage or one out of 100, one or how many out of 100, how many of, out of 1,000 people, just because it's an easier way to understand what the actual risk is. Um, as uh, Chris mentioned, the uh, biologics are an injectable. So for some people, that's a really big deal. They have a, a, a fear of needles or of giving injections. Um, so that's something to consider. And then you also want to consider your other health issues whenever you're starting any medication, because you don't want that the, your new medication to cause a problem for one of your other issues. So like Chris mentioned, the congestive heart failure um, and then affordability. I think that's something we consider all the time when we're looking at medications, because if you can't afford it, it's just not an option. So things to think about when you're considering um, starting a biologic or a medication it, for yourself is how severe is your HS? If it's on the milder side, there are still treatment options, but if it's more moderate or severe, you might be thinking about other treatment options. So the severity of the disease, how severe it is, may influence which option you go for. Is it stable and kind of holding steady or is it progressing? Is it getting worse? So this is a, another thing that Chris kind of touched on is your disease might not be bad now, but if the flares are getting closer and closer and they're getting worse and you're getting more spots each time, that shows us that it's progressing and we want to stop that progression before it gets more severe. Think about and talk about other treatments you've already tried, other health problems you had. And then, like I said, I always bring up that risk of under treatment. You know, what, what's going to happen to me if I don't do this treatment? Um, and, you know, we're not, we don't have crystal balls, so we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but that's where your, your healthcare provider may say, well, based on how things have been going, your disease is progressing and here's what I'm afraid it could, could happen. And then like we keep saying, the coverage and the cost are always considerations. Um, then this is something that Chris touched on. We call it the window of opportunity in HS, where because it causes damage to the tissue and the disease progresses, it's um, important to treat when we see it starting to get worse before it's too late and it gets worse. You can still treat it when it's at its worst, but the treatments work better earlier in the disease. So that's where we don't want to kind of wait too long and miss these opportunities. And we know for HS, one of the problems is awareness and getting the diagnosis earlier so you can get treatment earlier. So we're really trying to spread awareness as well. Side effects vary with different medications. Um, some of the common ones that we see with biologics, the most common is a little pain in your injection site or a little lump there um, because there is a needle that goes in to give you the medication. A lot of times they do suppress the immune system to different degrees for different medications. So it can slightly increase your risk of getting certain infections. So that's something that's important to talk to your doctor about if you've had infections, if you think you have one now. I know it's really tricky with HS because HS looks like an infection, even though it's not, and then it can also become infected. Um, so it's a, a tricky conversation with HS, but just talk to your doctor about it if you're worried about it. And then we have this thing with uh, some of the biologics where if you have tuberculosis, but you don't know it because it's not bothering you and you don't have any symptoms, when you start one of the bio some of the biologics, it can cause that tuberculosis to get worse. So we just check before we start one of these medications to see if you've been exposed. And then some have boxed warnings. So um, for the TNF inhibitors, there's a boxed warning for a risk of a certain type of blood cancer called lymphoma. So that's something to think about and talk about with your doctor. And then we think about other things like if, you, if you've had a history of a cancer or inflammatory bowel disease, congestive heart failure, that helps us kind of choosing which medication could be the best fit for you considering those other issues. And then I keep mentioning coverage and cost. 
you are not going to pay for a biologic medication out of pocket. They do like a lot of medications. They just aren't affordable. Coverage varies state to state. So each state sort of makes their own um, coverage criteria and determinations and each insurance company does. Um, so it's really hard to give advice about coverage because it's so different everywhere. And then a lot of these will require what we call prior authorization, which means you can't get the medication until the insurance reviews everything and decides if you meet their criteria for it. Part of that might be something we call step edits or step therapy, where they sort of have a ladder. They say, you have to try this treatment. If that doesn't work, this one. If that doesn't work, this one. And so the biologic may be somewhere in that ladder and they might just ask, well, have you tried this already? Have you tried that already? And then there are some patient assistant programs. So if you don't have insurance and can't afford your medication, or even if sometimes if you do have insurance and can't afford your medication, um, the companies that manufacture them can sometimes help you out um, by, by waiving some fees or, or helping you get access, which is great to just make sure people can get their meds. So I touched on prior authorization. This is where the insurance company checks to say, these are the rules we made for you to get this medication. Have you met all these criteria in these rules? Um, usually it does require some of those step therapies. You have to try this first. You have to try that first. And what they may do is they might ask your doctor or your provider for um, their records so they can review the records to see what you've already tried, um, how severe your disease is, what problems it's causing you. If you do find out that a medication needs a prior authorization, um, one thing you can do is, uh, depending who let you know, if it was the pharmacy or if it was, yeah, basically if it was the pharmacy, make sure that your doctor's office is aware of that. Some pharmacies will contact us to get help. Other ones just tell you. Um, then you can actually call your insurance. So you can ask your insurance, you know, what information do you need to, to get this prior authorization done? And then I'll tell you, the insurance company always gives the same answer, which is we're waiting for more information from your doctor. So when they say we're waiting for more information from your doctor, it would be helpful if you say, what have they already given you? And I actually tell patients, say, read that out loud to me. Because once you know what information they need and you make them read the notes we already sent, sometimes they realize they already have the information. They just haven't looked at it yet. Um, then the other thing you can ask if they still say they need more information is say, well, what was the last date that you received information from the doctor's office? Because then you can call us and it is possible maybe a fax didn't go through or something was lost. Um, if you do feel like your insurance company is making it harder than it should be and not helping you as much as you want, um, each state has a way for you to ask the state to sort of investigate what the insurance company is doing. You have a contract with them, you're paying them, and they owe you a service. So there's a state board that regulates insurance companies. Um, so if you really feel like your insurance company is doing something that's not right or unjust, you can contact the state to get some help. So you're not alone. And then sometimes with biologics, we do combine them with our other treatments. Right now in HS, some patients might just need one treatment to get under control, but many patients need a combination of things. So if both treatments, the biologic and the second one, weaken the immune system or affect the immune system, that could increase some of the risks, like the infection risk. Um, but in HS, we have a lot of treatments that don't alter the immune system and work in other ways that we can combine them with. So some of the things that we have proven in our research that we've combined with biologics are our washes. So you might've heard of some of the antibiotic washes or antimicrobial washes, some of the topical treatments we use and some of the oral antibiotics. Um, methotrexate and prednisone have also been used together with biologics and studies. And then in real world experience, we've combined a lot of our other treatments because like Chris said, the biologics usually don't interact with other medications because they're different than medications. And someday in the future, we may even be combining multiple biologics that target different parts of the immune system. Um, we're seeing this as a trend in some other diseases outside of HS, and it may be something we need to do in the future, but right now there aren't any studies of combining multiple um, biologics. We do have studies of combining a biologic and surgery. So we have studies showing both. Uh, we have studies that show biologics can help your surgery to go better, and there's no increased risk of side effects from the surgery or problems or complications. And we have studies that show surgery can help biologics work better. So sometimes the biologic really calms down the inflammation, but you still have a draining tunnel that it can't really affect. And so then you do surgery on that tunnel and all of a sudden you're really doing good because it's, you have those two elements combined. 
So we know that they're safe to use together and effective. Um, and the, the initial study that combined the biologic with surgery also proved to us that it's safe to stay on your biologic when you're having surgery, which is great. So that way you can keep that disease as calm as possible through your surgery and when you're healing. And then I'm just going to take a quick minute to talk about shared decision making. So shared decision making is the idea that um, when there's a few options that could be good for you, you and your healthcare provider talk together and figure out what's going to be best for you. So this is a, a model that I like to use that has three phases. There's the team talk where you basically, the doctor says, we're going to work together. We're going to figure this out. Here are the options. Then you move to option talk where you talk about each of the options. What are the risks? What are the benefits? And then decision talk is where we really bring in um, the patient's preferences too. So with shared decision-making, the provider and the patient each bring something to the table. The provider knows the medical information. We know what options are out there, what medicines and surgeries there are, the risks and the benefits. What you bring as the patient is your experience, your knowledge, and then your preferences when it comes to cost, time, fears, concerns. So that way we can kind of open that dialogue and work together to find out what's going to work best for you instead of us just telling you what to do or you just trying to make a decision without having all the information. So shared decision-making is really ideal. We strive to do it all the time. It really applies when there are multiple options that are great. When there's one option that's the best for a certain disease, we could just say, hey, this is the best thing. This is what you should do. But when there are multiple things to choose from, shared decision-making is the best way to get to somewhere that is going to have the best chance of helping you and consider your preferences. So I want to thank everybody so much for joining us. And I think we have time now to open it up to the Q&A. I saw some Q&A questions already coming in. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Syed and Dr. Dave Louie for this amazing talk on biologics. We definitely have a few questions, um, more than just a few. So we're going to dive in to um, some of these questions. Um, one question is, is it possible to explain the different stages of HS? Sure, you know, Steve, we can maybe go back and forth some here. I mean, I can jump in and, and start with this one and then definitely fill in any gaps that I leave, please. Um, and so uh, so there's yeah, generally considered three stages or Hurley stages. Um, and that was named for a surgeon named Harry Hurley back like decades ago when he just uh, happened to write a textbook chapter about HS. And he kind of made it up out of thin air, but it was the way that a surgeon would typically think about the condition. Um, so Hurley stage one is typically where there are just bumps that are coming and going. They don't leave much of a mark or a scar behind it all. And a patient like that in a surgeon's mind like doesn't need any surgery. So I think that's why they called it early stage one. Early stage two is where there is some scarring and tunneling present. Uh, and again, in a surgeon's mind, that's somebody who might need a little bit of surgery. And then stage three is where there's a lot of tunneling and scarring present throughout the entire area. And again, in a surgeon's mind, that needs a lot of surgery probably. So that was a simple breakdown of how they thought about what would I need to do for patients based on how much their disease has progressed over time? But, you know, you have to keep in mind that that doesn't always completely match up severity, right? So, or with what we think of like disease activity. So some patients might have a lot of scarring and have early stage three disease, but they might have very little in the way of like pain or drainage or things like that. And so we often use other measures um, to sort of measure how active the disease is instead. And those aren't really talked about quite as much. Um, those aren't sort of like, you know, people think of, of early stage one or early stage two. There's scales we use to count up how active the inflammation is at any given time. Um, so Hurley scores are helpful because, you know, it sort of talks about how much things have progressed or how much sort of skin damage has occurred over time. Um, but it doesn't always tell you that, uh, that there's not activity, right? A Hurley stage one patient that has five or 10 lesions that are coming and going all the time, you know, if they don't have that much scar and tunneling, like that is still in my mind, very active, like very intense disease that requires treatment sometimes. So that Hurley stage one, two, three, it you know, doesn't tell the entire story, but it does give a sense of how much of things progressed and how much skin damage has accumulated over time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Dave Louis, did you want to add anything to that? I think Chris covered it really well. Um, sometimes you may also hear, we, we sort of use that Hurley stage one, two, three, almost to say mild, moderate, severe. Um, but like Chris mentioned, uh, the, the Hurley stage two has kind of a wide range of, of, you can sort of have mild stage two or severe stage two. So it's important to look at that overall picture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I want to get into uh, another question. Why is, TB why is a TB test required when getting approved for biologics? 
So that's a great question. Um, certain, certain biologics block certain parts of the immune system. So some of the biologics that block this thing called tumor necrosis factor alpha or TNF alpha, um, TNF alpha can be involved in our body's ability to fight tuberculosis. So if you get tuberculosis, your body tries to fight it off. And so if we block that TNF alpha, it might lower your body's uh, ability to fight off tuberculosis. And tuberculosis is interesting because we all think of tuberculosis as you get it, you have this cough and maybe a bloody cough, but there's a version of tuberculosis that's called latent tuberculosis. And that just means that you have it, but it's not active. It's almost like it's just hanging out in your lungs and relaxing and chilling and waiting. Um, and so you can pick it up and you have no idea you have tuberculosis or you've ever been exposed to it because you've never had a cough or any symptoms. In those patients, if we block, your body might be suppressing that tuberculosis. And if your biologic sort of weakens your body's ability to do it, some people had their tuberculosis then become more active. So we check beforehand to make sure you're not one of those people who has tuberculosis and doesn't know it. Since some of those medications, there's a risk that then it could become active tuberculosis. If we did find that you had it and you didn't know it, um, we just treat it. There's a treatment regimen um, laid out already for latent tuberculosis for those people who have that hiding tuberculosis. So it doesn't mean you can never have a biologic. It just means you have to treat the tuberculosis first so that it's safe to then start the biologic without a risk of making that tuberculosis active. Dr. Syed, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, it's a great summary. You know, I think, uh, you know, we do the same for things like hepatitis B and C, like for the most part, those things are, you know, still, you know, relatively low risk overall, even when they're present we can, and we can treat people, even if they've got, you know, hepatitis B and C a lot of times, or if they've, you know, had do screen positive for TB, we'll treat them. And pretty much like a couple of weeks later, we can start them on a biologic still. So it's not a deal breaker. It's just one of those things that we don't want to miss. Um, and, and as much as tuberculosis sounds very scary, like, you know, at least in the United States, the rates are very low in most countries. It is certainly in other countries, TB is more endemic and there's a lot more concern about it. But because rates in places like the U.S. are so low, there some argue that we sort of overscreen for TB, right? That like probably an initial checkup just to make sure it makes sense. But to do it every single year for patients who are in very low risk environments, like, you know, about one out of 100 tests probably comes back as a false positive, meaning that like even though somebody doesn't have tb the test results positive anyway and so then we get very worried and we do chest x-rays and we recheck their testing and they end up being negative the majority of the time i get a positive test back um so it could be that we we do it sort of more than we need to but because we know there is this risk because in clinical trials they did it that way often what we do in the real world mimics how they do things in clinical trials also because they said if you did it this way in the trial we should do it this way in real life um, so it's possible guidance will change where it might start to be a one-time checkup and then maybe it'll be looser as time goes on. But, you know, it's just really an abundance of caution, making sure we're not missing something that's very treatable. Mm -hmm. I want to get into the next question. Um, how have you found, uh, biologics? Uh, let me rephrase this actually. Um, is it, do biologics um, tend to clear up more than one condition? So if there's existing comorbidities or other skin conditions that uh, a patient might have along with HS, is that, have you seen that within the patients that you all have treated? Yeah, and, and I'll start off on that one. So that is, you know, often something we very much take into account is does the patient have some sort of inflammatory arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease at the same time? I kind of mentioned before that some classes of drugs, you know, are approved for many conditions. Like, you know, if you look at adalimumab, which was approved for uh, for HS, you know, years ago, it has over a dozen different sort of FDA approved indications at this point, inflammatory eye disease, inflammatory bowel disease, lots of different types of arthritis. And so we often take that into consideration and try to cross cover. So for example, yeah, if a patient has, you know, psoriasis and inflammatory bowel disease and hydradenitis all at once, then sure, I would pick in a TNF inhibitor knowing that it cross covers for all those things. Um, and other scenarios like, you know, IL-17 or other targets, again, cross cover things like uh, inflammatory arthritis or, uh, you know, certain other medicines coming up or approved for things like eczema or atopic dermatitis. So, yeah, we're, we're often sort of thoughtful and selective trying to, you know, if we can use one medicine to treat everything. And then when there are situations we need multiple medications, you know, we sort of stack them together sometimes if we really need to. Yeah, and I agree. I love when I can find one medicine that's indicated for multiple problems and it helps everything out. Um, 
we were always hoping for that and looking for that. And, and so that's one of the things, like Chris said, that, that factors into our decision. Well, I want to talk about effectiveness next. Um, can biologics lose their effectiveness over time? So there is some study, there are some studies and some research that show for some patients they do um, or they can. So for the majority of patients, if it's working for you, it'll continue to work for you. But for some patients with time, it can start to lose its effect. And we don't fully understand why. Um, since like Chris mentioned, biologics are these bigger molecules and they kind of float around in our bloodstream like antibodies. Um, you can form your own antibodies against them. So at first we thought, aha, that's it. You're making antibodies and it's getting rid of the, the biologic and that's why it's not working. But as we did more research, that didn't always match up. So some people get the antibodies, but their biologic keeps working fine. Um, we can also now measure those antibodies and we can measure the level of the biologic in your blood for certain biologics. So if we think it's losing its effect, that's often now what we do as our next step is we say, all right, let's measure if you have antibodies against the medicine. And after you get the medicine, how high is the level in your bloodstream? Because that tells us if you're getting a level that's up where it should be working, um, then maybe the antibodies aren't doing anything to it. But if it's getting a level where it's lower down, then we know why you're sort of losing the effect. And that can help us to make decisions of, do we need to change the dose of the biologic? You know, is it just need to push it up a little higher? Or is it time to start thinking about a different one because it's, it's lost its effect in a way that we probably won't be able to recapture? So we're still sort of trying to figure out why this happens and why it tapers off for some people and, and doesn't for others. Um, but at least now we're getting some, some good research that helps support us making decisions and what to do when we suspect that might be happening. Yeah, I mean, that's all right on point, Steve. But, you know, the, the other thing that, you know, so a lot of medicines, you know, can hold up and sort of continue their improvement over time. Um, and, and usually that's the case, I'd say, like in the majority of patients, if you're doing great three to six months in, like most of the time that response is going to hold up for a year, a couple of years even, and sometimes much longer than that. And that's why the medications end up being very open-ended sometimes. Like, it's not like we say, we're going to treat you for six months and everything's better. It really is a matter of controlling it over a long period of time, hopefully then a one-time cure, which I wish we all had. Um, uh, and, and then we sort of play it by ear over time, right? Like if things are great for a long time, because I, I have a lot more patients in there, you know, 20s, you know, teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s, 50s, 60s. So over time, a lot of inflammatory conditions do sort of fizzle out and become less active. And hopefully we can potentially back off of those medicines over time. Um, but it is, you know, an open question where we have to sort of play by ear some and see how well things go. And we think about, you know, hopefully how long the medicine's going to last and, 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 and sort of, you know, can we eventually taper down over time in some way? The other thing that changes over time is like our expectations sometimes. So like, even if somebody is, you know, 50% better after three months, you know, that you see that momentum. I think, you know, everybody kind of feels pretty positive after that first few months, seeing things move the right direction. The trouble is like, if nine months or a year goes by and you said, yeah, I had, you know, 10 lesions to start with. And now I have, you know, three or four all the time. And I still have to wear a bandage. Like, I think, uh, it feels like it feels less positive because right there's still plenty of HS around that's causing trouble. And so even if the response is is relatively maintained, if it's kind of a modest response, we're still often thinking about, okay, what else do we need to change at this point? Or have we at least stabilized things, right? That's the, one of the big things I look for is, you know, maybe, you know, there's still some activity, but like, have you stopped developing new lesions, right? Have, has it stopped spreading and getting worse and progressing? That's also like a really important thing to achieve. And if we have stabilized things, and that's where, as Dr. David, we mentioned, like combining other medicines on top, or really combining surgery too, if it's like, look, I'm, I'm a lot better. I have three really stubborn areas that just won't go away, you know, but I'm not, it's not spreading. It's not getting worse. That's where surgery, I think, again, can kind of clean the slate and the medicine keeps it better afterwards. So, you know, I wish medicine alone always did it, but, but there's often those kind of considerations of sure the response holds up, but maybe it's not always as good as you want it to be. Absolutely. Let's talk about um, pregnancy and biologics and conceiving while using biologics. Um, how many of uh, how many biologics are safe to use while pregnant or while trying to conceive? Yeah, so it's a, you know, a very good question and you might get slightly different responses from different people. Um, I will tell you, like my general take, though, um, you know, TNF inhibitors have probably, been, like, you know, that's like adalimumab or infliximab that are often used for hydradenase. Those have kind of been around for a relatively long period of time relative to most others. And for that reason, 
even though they have none of these have been particularly studied in pregnant patients to say like half are going to get it and half not and let's and sort of see what happens with risk it's just very hard to justify doing those kind of studies because they've been around and so popular there have been plenty of pregnancy exposures over time and in the beginning those are often just sort of like by chance you know the patient didn't realize they were pregnant and those are always observed very very closely and that did not show sort of any types of trends towards there being, you know, more risk to the to the fetus or to the baby once it was born or more risk to the parents while they were in, in the pregnancy. Um, and then over time, because people have recognized that and because the inflammatory diseases themselves can have such a negative impact on a pregnancy with things like lower birth weights or other complications for things like inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, people just sort of said, okay, like there's pretty good safety data. I'm worried about the risk of not treating this person during their pregnancy and what that could mean. Um, and so it was kind of intentionally uh, done where people continued over time. And that if you look at like, you know, most patients with bad inflammatory bowel disease, it, it's pretty standard for them to treat through the entire pregnancy at this point. Sometimes they'll try to stop it in that last month or so to try to reduce how much the baby's going to have in its system when it's born. Um, not because that's been shown to be harmful, but because I think people are just, again, very cautious in that situation. And so in general, in my mind with hydradenitis, like you know, if a patient has terrible hydradenitis, like in the groin area, like you know, or sort of, you know, they're going to potentially get a C-section. They've got a lot of pubic area involvement, things like that. I think uh, I'm hesitant to often stop their medication and sort of just let things flare out of control, um, even towards like, you know, especially towards the end of pregnancy when when it maybe adds some more risk in terms of what the patient's going to have to deal with um, kind of right after giving birth also. So generally, I don't have much hesitation about continuing a bot, like, you know, a TNF inhibitor, like Adalim, Abrifliximab throughout an entire pregnancy. The main thing we sort of let patients know is that some of it will be in the baby system when it's born. And while that hasn't been tied to any risk at all, we generally try to avoid things like live vaccines um, while there's medication like that in somebody's system. So that the only really vaccine that applies to for kids these days in the first six months of life is a rotavirus vaccine. So I'll mention it to, to the moms, hey, like just ask your pediatrician not to give the living types of vaccines. But the vast majority of them don't uh, sort of don't, that's not relevant to those. So they can get most of their vaccines in that first six, six months of life just fine. So gen yeah, generally TNF and Evers, I don't have much hesitation about continuing throughout a pregnancy at this point. Other biologics, it's less clear. Um, so the IL-17 inhibitors, the ones that we tend to use for things like eczema, um, which like one called Dupilumab, you know, those don't have as much information out there because they haven't been around as long, but there's not really any strong indication that they're causing problems so far. So I think we're more hesitant in those groups or in, for those particular patients. But uh, I think it's, it's you know, more reassuring as time goes on that there's not particular effects. But Dr. Dave Louie, I'm talking too much about this. I'm mm -hmm. kind of rambling some here. So please, uh, please add in. No, oh, yeah, you covered it super well. Um, and, and I agree. And, and the reason, um, since these th these drugs act like antibodies, they get transferred over to, they can get transferred over to the baby, just like antibodies do. So like, like Chris said, right before birth is when mom kind of gives a lot of antibodies to the baby. So some people will do that pause, but I'm with you. If it's severe disease, I want it to be under control throughout the, the pregnancy and the birth. So I do talk to the patient, like, to, just like Chris said about, you know, some of these may be transferred to baby. Um, I also feel a little more reassured that some of the biologic medications are approved down to age six months. So I tell them, well, we know it's safe to, to for a six month old baby to get this medication too. Um, so it's one of those risk benefits, but the, but it is it, it is a challenge when you fear of the, the HS flaring up and you're thinking about delivering your baby and you're having a flare up of your HS at the same time. And, and like Chris said, that does lead to, we know from studies that patients with HS have an increased risk of having a C-section birth because if it involves the the genital region, then they're more likely and they're flared up, they're more likely to opt for a C-section. Um, and it kind of ties into breastfeeding too. We don't have a lot of data about breastfeeding on biologics, but like Chris mentioned earlier, um, these biologics have to be given by injection. You can't take them by mouth. So even if there is some in the breast milk, when, when once the baby ingests it, it's just gonna get dissolved in the stomach. Um, so it's something we talk about, but I always feel reassured that you literally can't take these medicines by mouth. They don't work if you do, because you just digest them. Absolutely. I have a question about um, drainage before using um, biologics. Um, do you typically need to drain um, abscesses or nodules uh, before starting biologics for more effective results? That's a great question, and it's not something that has particularly been studied. Um, in the studies, 
they were they they showed that the biologics worked they didn't include any kind of surgery in those initial studies and then in the more recent studies that combine the surgeries with the biologic they actually started the biologic first and that's often what we'll do in practice if you have like an abscess that's really driving you crazy we no matter what where we're at whether we're starting a biologic thinking about one already on one we're going to take care of that spot we're either going to inject it with some medication or or do a procedure called a de-roofing where we kind of drain it and take the top off um, but like i said that is a little bit more based on that's what we do for those spots um, so it kind of doesn't matter where you are in the studies where they combine them they started the biologic first and we often do that in practice to kind of get the disease as calm as possible get as much improvement as we can and then see what spots are left and aren't responding and are still draining or still giving you problems. And then those are good ones that um, to go with surgery because you go, you know what, this tunnel just is going to keep draining no matter what medicine we use. Let's just do a little mini surgery on this one um, and take care of it. So you don't necessarily need to have things drained before starting a biologic. Um, and sometimes it's helpful to actually get the medications on board, see how much improvement you get with that, and then see what's sort of left over and needs surgery. But if you do have a painful, swollen abscess, something that's really bothering you, you don't have to wait either. We sort of handle those. We have the, these treatments and we break them down into the medicines, the surgeries, and then the things we do for flare-ups or for acute lesions, you know, a really painful spot right now. So we have separate treatments just for those spots. If you kind of have a flare-up, it's good to be able to contact your, your provider, get in so they can do something to help with that spot. Yeah. And one thing that's just, yeah, worth driving home is that, you know, even when an abscess is present, because that may have been the concern is that there's an abscess, is there infection? And is that a reason to avoid starting it? But you know, we can't say enough, you know, HS, as much as it looks like and mimics infection, there's not usually true infection there. So even when that inflammation is kind of really running crazy and there's maybe abscesses around, that's, you know, all the more reason to treat and control things better. Um, so it can be counterintuitive sometimes because there's not really a true infection driving things. Yeah, like that sign of out of control inflammation is, is very much a reason to treat more aggressively. Absolutely. Um, considering it's so considering that we're going back into the sort of like flu season and um, COVID might be coming back up. Um, is COVID, are COVID vaccines good to take with Humira? I mean, more with a biologic, excuse me. Yeah, sure thing. I mean, you know, like most of the studies that came out around COVID, and if you look back at things like the flu also, um, you know, none of those studies have really shown that things like COVID or the flu are much more likely to happen when you're on a like a, something like a TNF inhibitor or most of the biologics that are around, or if you get COVID and you still get a good response to the vaccines when you're on those medicines, it doesn't block the response at all. And people don't necessarily seem to get sicker from things like COVID or the flu because it's just a type of infection your body can still fight okay. So yeah, absolutely, it's it's worth just like everybody else getting a COVID and a flu vaccine each year just to sort of prevent risk overall. Um, but it's not something where, uh, you know, it's because your system is so weakened that you like have to get it more than somebody else does necessarily. Perfect answer. <laughs> Can we talk about um, menopause and HS um, symptoms? Um, it, there's some like information about menopause potentially um, less decreasing HS symptoms um, or, you know, women who experience menopause going into remission. Can you all talk? a little bit more about that is that accurate information like so many things with hs it's an answer of yes and no it kind of varies person to person so for a lot of people for the majority of people the hs kind of shows up in your teens 20s maybe 30s um and then like chris said a lot of people will experience a sort of decrease in their hs symptoms um as they get into a more advanced age and kind of approach menopause go through menopause at the same time, there are cases that start during menopause. So some people didn't have it, and all of a sudden the hormonal changes of menopause somehow affected their HS, or people where it just doesn't change at all, or it could even get worse. So for most people, it does kind of get better with time. And we see that if you kind of look at everybody who has HS um, at a given snapshot, most people with it are in those teens, 20s, 30s, 40s. And as you get up into the 50s, 60s, 70s, the number of people who still have active HS sort of decreases. The other piece that's tricky with that is sort of classifying what is active HS because HS does can cause permanent damage to the skin, can cause the scarring and tunnels that 
sometimes you have HS throughout your life, but it's sort of that activity that changes. So it might calm down a little, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to heal and go away from the damage that it's done. Yeah, can't agree more. Yeah, it, it's the overall trend tends to be towards less activity as time goes on, whether it's linked to menopause or not. But there are exceptions to that rule, and I have patients in their you know 60s, 70s, 80s with HS, although it's just much less common. So yeah, general trends are there, but there's always exceptions. So it's hard to predict an individual. Absolutely. Well, with that being said, I have to wrap us up here. I want to thank you both so much for um, leading this conversation on biologics. We have like 32 other questions that came in, but unfortunately, we're unable to get to all of them because we have limited time. But I do want to remind you all to please um, take the poll, the survey um, after the Q&A. After we close out, there will be um, a survey that is uh, going to come up and prompt you. And then also, um, I do uh, want to let you know that we are sharing um, we are sharing the webinar. Um, it will be uh, no, I'm sorry. After the webinar, um, this it will be followed up by infographic and a Q and A sheet. Um, so if you have any um, questions there that weren't answered here, um, we are going to kind of be reviewing them. Um, following this, uh, this webinar. So um, thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. Um, we appreciate all your engagement and all your wonderful questions. We hope to see you next time for uh, another, another web webinar on HS. So thank you so much. <laughs>